Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the EVO Institute for Jewish Research. As many of you may know, EVO is at its core a library and an archive which documents Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have over 23 million documents in our collection and over 400,000 books. And in our public programs, we showcase the history and the culture that our collection archives in various ways that bring it to life. So a few years ago, we did a program which was a Yiddish leader abend, an evening of Yiddish language art songs. Um, and it was a really lovely program. And upon reflecting on it, we thought Yiddish is, so, is such a central part of Yivo's story and part of Yivo's collection that it was natural for us to host this concert. But in fact, many of these composers that wrote Yiddish art songs also wrote Hebrew art songs. And so there was a complementary mirror image of this uh, concert, which was a story waiting to be told for us. So that's the story that we'll be telling tonight. And we're really um, delighted to be working with our professor of music in residence, Neil W. Levin, who is the artistic director of the Milken Archive and professor emeritus at the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, a, a world expert on this music. So I'm not going to say too much, but I just want to say a few thank yous before I invite up Neil to give the pre-concert lecture about this music. I want to thank all of the musicians um, who've been working on this program. They've really put an extraordinary amount of, of effort into bringing this together. A lot of these songs are rare and unknown. Recordings don't exist. Texts had to be edited and found. Um, so I really want to thank all of them for the extra efforts that they put into this. And I also want to thank a team of volunteers at EVO, particularly Faina Burko, who helped with a lot of this work. It really would not have been possible without Faina. So thank you very much. And without further ado, Join me in welcoming Neil Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I should, um, I, I really would emphasize that of all the programs that, uh, that we've done together, but then all that I've done, this really is uh, the result of real teamwork and not just uh, all the people at EVA, but also the performers themselves. I mean, we really, even selection of music, um, the flow of the program, everything is the result of uh, a major uh, piece of teamwork. So we build this evening's recital appropriately as an evening of Hebrew song. What does that mean? What kind of Hebrew song? Well, my experience is that uh, very, very few have any idea uh, that there is actually a bona fide classical Hebrew leader or art song uh, repertoire that amounts to a counterpart in principle, not, not in substance, but in principle, a counterpart uh, to the uh, classical song canon associated with the likes of Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, Dubarg, Debussy, Benjamin Britten, Mazorsky, Grieg, and so on. And I have to say, this unfamiliarity appertains even amongst the most knowledgeable echelons of the classical music world, and also amongst the most well-educated adherents of secular modern Jewish culture, and I have to say, sadly, amongst concert audiences in Israel today. So for those who might assume that secular Hebrew song is limited to the arenas of folk and popular song, which is the most common assumption, um, a program such as this evening's could come as a very welcome discovery, a discovery of a neglected genre. And for others, our samplings will confirm some previous awareness. But there are still some, and I have a neighbor, for example, who delights in annoying me. Well, maybe that's not hard to do, it's true. But um, uh, with, in this case, insisting that maybe there was a deception with the limitation to the words, an evening of Hebrew song, because it doesn't stipulate. 
that is classical music, and it might disappoint people who had different expectations. So it could be deceiving. And uh, my answer to her was to make an analogy to a story, probably apocryphal, um, that I'll share with you about a, um, an incident involving a request for an employment reference. So in order to get this into focus, you have to think back to a time when references for professional positions were confined to the post. Anybody remember what that post office stamps, the whole thing? <laughs> and in those days, the cost, you might remember, of even domestic long-distance telephone calls was prohibitive. And then the long-distance operator, remember, would come on after three minutes to tell you that your time was up. So in that kind of time frame, there was a rabbi, Pelchik in Brooklyn, was head of a important yeshiva, and he was visited by uh, a former student of his asking for a reference for a position in Lincoln, Nebraska. And Rabbi Pelchik said to him, look, I can't give you a reference. You're the worst student I ever had. <laughs> you, you just got smicha, ordination, by the skin of your teeth because we felt sorry for you, but you don't know anything. I can't give you. But he pleaded with him. He said, look, you know, it's a question of parnosa, of, 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 of sustenance. I've got six children and a wife and all. Well, of course, there is a halachic uh, Indian in there about, about uh, the need for parnosa no matter what. So Pilchik said to him, look, all right, I'll, um, I'll figure out a way to word a letter that is not lying. And he sent the following letter to Nebraska. He said, all I can say about this young man is that he is a bit like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moses, our lawgiver. And he's a bit like Shakespeare in some respects. And in another respect, he's even like the Rabbanu Shalom himself, like God, like the master of the but He got the job on that basis, and after the first job, I mean, it was a total disaster, obviously. And uh, the president of the Shul in Lincoln writes back to Pilchik in Brooklyn. He says, how could you deceive us and tell us that he's a bit like Shakespeare, he's a bit like Rabbanu a bit like Moshe Rabbein? The man could not speak a sentence in English. He couldn't put words together in proper order. His sermon was a disaster. He, doesn't, he barely knows the language. Hebrew, forget Hebrew. He doesn't know a word of Hebrew. He couldn't translate the prayers. He couldn't read from the Torah. He doesn't know anything. And on top of it, he's a nasty guy. He's not a match. How could you deceive us? So Rabbi Kilchik looked back and said, I didn't deceive you. Not one word that I said isn't the truth. I said he's a little bit, or in, 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 in some respects, uh, he has characteristics like Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't speak one word of English. <laughs> said, uh, I said... In another respect, he's like Shakespeare. Shakespeare could read from the Torah. Shakespeare didn't know what he And you said he's not even a mensch. And I said, yes, I said he has a characteristic in common with the Rabbana Shalom. Well, I got news for you. The Rabbana Shalom is nicht a mensch. God is not a man. So nothing I said wasn't true. So referring to Hebrew song as this evening's theme, without any qualifiers, is nothing short of the truth. It may be a different kind of Hebrew song than is usually heard, uh, and we hope to correct that. So the selection that we have made, I would say illustrates three stages in the development of the genre of classical Hebrew leader. And I think, to begin with, that this evening's program embodies a kind of appropriate expansion and a broadened view of Yivo's mission vis-a-vis -vis the totality of Eastern European Jewish culture. Because I suspect that 50 or so years ago, only a Yiddish program would have been heard in terms of vocal music as part of Yivo's raison d'etre. Um, and of course, that was for a number of reasons, because until not that long ago, much Jewish art, literature, aesthetics, and other cultural expression, was still caught up in the, that irrelevant crossfire of contentious 
even polemical dialectics between Yiddishists and Hebraists, which is to say, between opposing affinities and attachments, and also between two unnecessarily competing sets of symbols or symbolisms, each with its own bias, each with its own emphasis, but creating an unfortunate notion of mutual exclusivity which really no longer plagues us. Now in that former period, on the other hand, here, especially in America, public, public exposure to Hebrew, in terms of song and culture generally, was left to the purview of organizations uh, that specialize in that, Zionist-leading organizations, Hebrew culture organizations, and so forth, and they had no use for anything Yiddish. But they perceived Yiddish as an outdated relic with no appeal or relevance to younger generations, which, of course, one has only to spend a few minutes at Yivok to find out that that is no longer true. Succeeding decades have fortunately given us a better, I don't know if I dare use the misused word inclusive, um, sense of, of a perspective. So we now recognize modern Hebrew culture as part of the whole story of Eastern European Jewry. Jonathan Brent, our own Jonathan Brent, once described Yivo's holdings, or many times described Yivo's holdings, as the Dead Sea Scrolls of more than a millennium of Eastern European Jewish life and culture. To follow that trenchant analogy, then, one of those pillars, one of those scrolls, has to include the language literature, arts, journalism, and the intellectual activity of modern Hebrew culture as it developed too and flourished among certainly at least a, a respectable number uh, within the wider orbit of Eastern European Jewry. But abandonment of Yiddish culture was never a prerequisite and that is often misunderstood. Bialik, Chaim Nachman Bialik, provides, I think, an exemplary model. As the unofficial but de facto poet laureate of Israel, his name is effectively synonymous with the elevation of modern Hebrew poetry from its kind of weak state prior to that as a result of the Western Haskalah. And yet he wrote poetry in Yiddish and in Hebrew and his verse in both languages is prominently represented in the song repertoire of the classical composers of Hebrew and Yiddish leaders. Also, to appreciate the valued place of Hebrew within the wider framework of Yiddish culture that did predominate in Eastern Europe, and as a way of kind of situating the gestation of Hebrew leader within that framework, we have only to recall the role played by Yitzhak Leib Peretz at the 1908 Chernovitz Conference. Many of you are familiar with that. The conference was convened to boost the national standing and the credential of the Yiddish language. One of the all-time Godoli giants and one of the most significant figures among Yiddish authors and poets, dramatists, Playwrights, Paris was the ultimate spokesman and the ultimate champion for Yiddish culture. And he was largely responsible at that conference for the recognition of Yiddish as a bona fide language in its own right. In other words, not a folk, inferior, regional, muddled, corrupt dialect of German, not some internal vehicle for the uneducated, uh, but to the contrary, no less a highly cultivated and developed language than French, German, or Polish, or Russian, English, what have you. And yet, at that same conference, Peretz vehemently rejected a resolution that went further to call for Yiddish to be declared officially the language of the Jewish people, the national language of the Jewish people. In other words, as opposed to Hebrew, because he was unwilling to jettison Hebrew. And he was unwilling to see scuttled the new modern Hebrew culture that had the Hebrew language at its base. Parents was what we might call a non-Zionist. 
He was not an anti-Zionist. He actually believed at one point that the ideal future autonomous home for Polish Jewry was Poland. But that was before everything that happened later. In fact, in that same time frame, uh, Peretz promoted Hebrew arts and activities in Poland. He was one of the chief organizers, for example, of a society known as Hazomer, started in Warsaw, and they had branches in Lodz, Czarnowitz, and many other cities. And Hazomer was a society that sponsored in the, under the same name a large amateur Jewish chorus in each of those cities, called the Hazomer Chorus, of course, that sang everything in modern Hebrew. Cantatas, oratorios, concert versions of operas, all in Hebrew. There was a spate of Hebrew advancement in Eastern Europe even earlier. By the end of the 19th century, there was publication of Hebrew journals, even some devoted to music, Hebrew newspapers, Hebrew lectures, although there's no question, we're not claiming otherwise, that these drew upon a finite subgroup of the Jewish intelligentsia. In Tsarist Russia, there was a society that met in Moscow that was known as Chovavei Svat Ever, lovers of the Hebrew language. And shortly after the February 1917 revolution, that is to say the second of the three revolutions, it changed its name and began to promote Hebrew schools and Hebrew cultural activities until that was ended, of course, by the regime after the October Revolution. Among other schools in Eastern Europe committed to modern Hebrew, I think the most celebrated and probably the most familiar to people today <coughs> was the thriving network of schools in Poland <coughs> called Tarbut. Its alumni were among those who responded to the need in America for modern-oriented Hebrew teachers to replace the old cheder format. And uh, this was as early as even in the 1920s, um, there were public high schools in major cities in America that taught Hebrew as an alternative foreign language to French or German or Latin. And then, of course, in uh, the Congregational Afternoon Hebrew schools by the 1950s, most of the teachers were from that Tarbut milieu. Now, of course, the fluent Hebrew that those teachers spoke, whether in Europe or here amongst themselves, was literary, correctly pronounced, correctly accentuated, but Ashkenazi Hebrew, without any regional corruptions, I should add. And I, I like to call this Bialik Hebrew, uh, because it's that cultured Ashkenazi Hebrew that informed the songs on tonight's program by Karain and Akron and Engel and Alman. Neither they, nor the Hebraist schools in Russian Poland, could ever have foreseen that a version leaning on Sephardi vocalization and stresses, but not, as is often misassumed, Sephardi Hebrew, would become the official usage of a new state as Israeli Hebrew. In any case, those Hebrew teachers from Eastern Europe spoke Yiddish also with equal fluency, and they routinely read both Yiddish and Hebrew newspapers. Hebrew and Yiddish complementing each other was also a twin happenstance on the dramatic landscape. Habima, for example, which produced its plays in Hebrew, was born and based in Russia. It later became the National Theater of Israel. But simultaneously, to cite just one case, the productions of the Vilner Truppe were in Yiddish, including the premiere of Ansky's famous play, The Dibuk whose 100th anniversary, by the way, is just about upon us, 2020. But then a few years later, to round out the circle, Habima gave the premiere of the play's Hebrew version in Bialik's translation. I hope that some of us at least here remember the beloved Masha Benya, the undisputed doyen of Yiddish and Hebrew song alike. In 1997, she was a about 90 years old. She was given a major award and responded as follows. I'll quote just a little bit of it. She said, 
about her home in, in Europe. Our home was traditionally orthodox. Yet my entire family admired and respected both secular and Jewish learning, culture, literature, and music. Even Schubert's Ave Maria somehow seemed kosher. I did not have to bridge over from classical to Jewish music, or vice versa. And I did not have to choose between Yiddish and Hebrew songs. There was no conflict. Now, of course, we all know that Yiddish was the daily, if not exclusive, spoken language of the vast majority of Eastern European Jewry up to and beyond the First World War. And we are all aware that Yiddish culture predominated by far, not only amongst the so-called uh, folk masses, but in merchant classes and by choice in intellectual circles. But I submit to you that reliance solely on numbers, on majorities, on numerical domain, is neither the most sagacious nor the most discerning and certainly not the most thorough way to evaluate a society, a culture, or a population. Even if some constituents vastly outnumber others, in this case Yiddish over Hebrew. So several songs on our program this evening belong to the first of three developmental phases to which I alluded at the beginning. In that seminal phase, composers of what we call the New Jewish National School in Russia were preoccupied with a search for a new harmonic language. They were looking for a, a new harmonic language that would suit both the modalities and the spirit of these folk material sources that were at the basis of their compositions and a Jewish national music overall, more appropriately than typical 19th century Germanic harmonization. Because they felt that what was clearly Western harmonic practice, even if it had become greatly enriched by the beginning of the 20th century, would only trivialize the melodic substance of Jewishly associated music. So in their struggle to that end, these composers were open for one thing, to modernism. I should say what was then heard as modernism. They were open to synagogue prayer modes. They were open to biblical cantillation. Because these things were at least older than the folk melosh. And they were open to groundless but imagined echoes of what they thought was Jewish antiquity. Now, by Jewish antiquity, they meant, and we mean, the period of the temples in ancient Jerusalem, maybe a few centuries or several centuries afterwards, but especially what some have thought was actually the intonation of the temple choirs. Many composers thought that by eliminating or at least reducing triadic harmony with the third tone of a scale, raised sevenths, or leading tones, and replacing these with open fourths and fifths, sometimes superimposed on each other, as well as unisons or unadorned octaves, they could capture a hint of the flavor of what seemed to them at least relatively ancient. And if not ancient, at least more Jewishly authentic than encrusted European practice. Now, what they meant was this kind of thing. Instead of or even knowing anything of the, uh, of the actual sound of Jewish antiquity, or for that matter, any other antiquity. We don't have any idea what music sounded like in ancient Greece. We only know what was written about it. For one thing, there was no harmony of any kind. 
in the, in the temple practice. There was no simultaneity of tones. Musicological as well as Judaic scholarship has revealed much about um, properties and characteristics of temple psalmody, which is the singing of psalms in the temple, but only verbally, only in the abstract. Any attempt to replicate the actual temple performance is an exercise in sheer fantasy. In this sense, in this case, we are a little bit like the eunuchs in the harems of sultans in the sense that we know all about it, but we can't do it. We have enough trouble, and we have enough difficulty, and we have enough disagreement about just how works of Bach and Handel sounded in their day. Chorus size, phrasing, articulation, tempi, and so on. If it matters, if it makes any difference for artistic purposes, and if those composers would even care. But in the absence of any form of musical notation, let alone any performance continuum, Jewish antiquity is really off limits. And this is why, when I'm consulted frequently about what authentic music to have scored as background for documentary or even feature films that have segments or scenes relating to Jewish or any antiquity, I always urge using something completely abstract. Ideally non-tonal, pantonal if you want, 20th century avant-garde, as dissonant as possible, because this will not innocently be misheard or misinterpreted as an authoritative reproduction of chronologically corresponding sounds. In other words, so as not to, to deceive unsuspecting viewers. And I have to say, on the other hand, that the New Jewish National School composers made no claim to musicology. First of all, at that time, Historical musicology was still primarily a German discipline anyway, quite different from the Russian brand of ethnomusicology. And from artistic vantage points, their invocation of imagined authenticity, as imagined as it was, did provide a kind of freshness and at the same time a kind of distant, remote ambience to what they were looking for in terms of a Jewish national music, one that would not simply duplicate host cultures. Now, that's one stage. An altogether different type of Hebrew song belongs to the succeeding developmental phases, and this involved the initial generation or two of modern Israel. So, conspicuous on our program tonight are songs by leading figures of that group, Paul Ben Chaim, Cheskel Braun, and Mark Lavery. Beginning around the 1930s and continuing through about the 50s, Composers such as these also were looking to establish a new Jewish national music. But this time, they were about to establish one that would no longer rely for its primary sources on the Eastern European sector of the diaspora. Now the desiderata of a universally applicable Jewish national music was to emanate from and be grounded in the reborn and rebuilt central hub and home of the Jewish people. So the new national music would incorporate elements of indigenous regional musics, Arabic and Turkish, as well as Oriental Jewish ones, and it would bespeak a national optimism. It would emphasize the future, but be grounded in a resumption of history. Well, most prominent in any consideration of this approach is this notion Many of you may be familiar with it, of a Mediterranean style that was promulgated by the composers of Ben Chaim's generation and one or two generations after that. Uh, this was seen at the time as replacing, or at least overshadowing, anything wholly European. Now, of course, as you would expect, some post 1980s revisionists have naturally contested the very existence of a Mediterranean style, but then they contest just about everything anyway. And I have to say that uh, I've dealt with this a great deal. I've written about it a little bit in the program for tonight. Uh, but I do think that the Mediterranean style principle contains certain aesthetic symbols, 
cultural symbols, even later on quasi-political symbols, of Jewish nationalism which apply audibly to the music. One of the least known episodes in that whole history of Hebrew song is something called the Hans Nathan Project. Four songs on our program this evening owe their artistic persona and their elevation from folk to art song or leader status to that project. Those are the songs that you will see in your program identified as arranged by Stefan Volpe, Aaron Copeland, and Kurt Weil. But the arrangement credit is technically correct, but a bit misleading, as you will hear. Who was Hans Nathan? Until he immigrated to the United States in 1936, he was a young uh, Jewish musicologist living in Berlin. And in the 1930s, he came up with a brainstorm, which was this a classically oriented Hebrew leader repertoire, but drawing on the accumulated corpus of what we now call Shirei Am. Folk music, songs of the people, songs of the land of Israel, Aliyah songs, songs of the Chalutzim, or pioneers. Which is to say, by now, an Israeli folk song. And this was born of the need in the 1930s, if not earlier, for a new Jewish national song, one that would be now rooted in the Jewish national home. But the problem was there was no historical, artistic, or literary precedent. There was no precedent for a modern, secular Jewish national song. There was no precedent for a song of the Jewish people as a diverse, and yet integral and now reconstituted nation with or without any political entity. And of course, there was no precedent for a song of the people that would invite and encourage diaspora Jewry, especially impressionable young people, to make Aliyah themselves and partake directly. So, an applicable body of national song, which would become Israel's folk song, required invention de novo. And it has been estimated that the core repertoire of that newly created genre from about 1920 to about 1950 came to include more than 4,000 items. These were disseminated by oral transmission, by song sheets with words only, and musically notated sources, usually, but not always, in that order. Now, in this connection, I just want to briefly remind ourselves that a folk song need not necessarily be anonymous. It might be, might not. The folk song status derives first and foremost from its dissemination through oral tradition and oral transmission. This is a definitive factor, even if, unbeknownst to the folk, notated, even printed, even published sources might have preceded the songs being known and sung by the folk. Even if a song's notation follows in its original and established folk life, maybe as ethnological documentation or maybe as commercial publication, the primary function of the song was folk song because of its oral transmission. The antiquated notion, which was born and perpetuated largely out of a kind of 19th century German romanticism that folk song is conceived spontaneously, spontaneously, as folk expression. That it springs from the soil on its own, as it were, from what were then called racial inclinations. And therefore, that it can have no composer. That's a laughable proposition today. Some initial germ or form of every folk song had to be invented by someone, no matter how many variants follow later. And like any other uh, music or poetry, folk songs are not created by imagined committees. There's only two rather weird 
exceptions come to mind, and these have to do with classical music composed by committees. One was a composition by a people's committee of the composers during a brief stretch in communist China. And the earlier one was truly bizarre, an episode in the 1930s Soviet Union of the tyranny of what was known as RAPAM, the Russian Association of People's Musicians. I think if you glance at the results of either experiment, you will understand why a camel has been defined as a horse designed by committee. <laughs> so three of the four artistically arranged songs on our program tonight, belonging to this category of Shire Am, have identified composers and identified poets. Only one is anonymous in both respects, but it had a composer and it had a poet. Maybe or maybe not the same person. We just don't know who he, she, or they were. Now, beginning in the 1930s, one of the chief vehicles for disseminating this body of songs that are called Shire Am was their notation and printing on postcards. In place of the usual picture on the reverse of the address side. This was an initiative of the Karen Kayemet Yisrael, the Jewish National Fund. That fund was founded in 1901 for the original and primary purpose of purchasing land, collecting donations to purchase the land and so forth uh, in Ottoman Palestine from Ottoman Turkish sellers at many times the value of the property. Um, in some cases from Arabs, although most were too downtrodden and oppressed by the Turks to have any land worth selling. But many of us might recall Karen Kayemet in connection with tree planting, right? Mostly on the very properties that it had purchased earlier for the Jewish National Home. Now around 1930, the 29 years after they were founded, the land purchase, Karen Kayemet came up with this idea of disseminating the accumulated body of Israeli folk song printed in musical notation, in full musical notation, with the composer and the poet listed on the postcards. This way they would generate some income for their mission, but they'd also help create an awareness of Shirei Am. Nathan is said to have relied heavily on these postcards that were very popular at the time. I think the extent to which his project relied on them has been exaggerated, but the connection between the project and the postcard distribution is unquestionable. His goal was a classical or quasi-classical leader-type repertoire rooted in Shire Am. But you see, he intuited that there was still a large audience of cultured Jewry, especially with German Jewish roots, that would not appreciate folk song in its raw form. But if a folk song were elevated primarily by an artistic, sophisticated piano part with little, if any, change to the vocal line, it would become leader. It would be acceptable to audiences who would go to hear Mussorgsky or Grieg or Schumann but wouldn't go to hear folk music in a pub. And I think you'll hear that he was really onto something. The roster of composers whom he invited to participate in this project by creating one, two, or three artistic settings, the roster is staggering. Not only in terms of the prestige of the composers who agreed, but also the very fact of their readiness of Jewish composers from such diverse backgrounds, with such differing Jewish sensibilities, such differing artistic leanings, all to participate in this project as a way of contributing their gifts to the cause of a Jewish national home in what was then mandatory Palestine. So in addition to the three composers represented on this evening's program, Kurt Weil, Aaron Copeland, and Stefan Volpe, that roster included Darius Mio, Ernst Toch, Paul Dessau, Arthur Oniger, Eric Walter Sternberg, Lazar Siminski, and many others whose music still remains to be edited. So the four samplings of this project 
evening are interspersed among a wide variety of Hebrew leader. And we begin the program appropriately with two very different settings of the same poem by one of the giants of modern Hebrew poetry, Saul Chernikovsky, writing from Russia. Omrim Yeshna Eretz. They say that there is a land where everyone who enters will find, as Rabbi Akiva would have said, with peace in mind, that the entire Jewish people is holy. And that is how we shall begin this evening's program. 